for a quick prayer as we begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We give thanks unto you, Lord our God, who has raised us up from our beds and has put into our mouths a word of praise, that we may worship and call upon your holy name. We entreat you by your mercies which you have exercised always in our life. Send down now also your aid upon those who stand before the face of your holy glory and await the rich mercy which is from you. Grant that they may always with fear and love adore you, praise you, hymn you, and worship your inexpressible goodness. For unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Good. Can everybody see the screen? Clearly? Good. All right, good morning. Christ is in our midst, he is and always shall be. Uh, I'm very excited to get started once again. I thought that um, last year uh, we did the Divine Liturgy. And I personally, as a priest who went to seminary for three years, learned so many things about the Divine Liturgy. Uh, my understanding was certainly uh, deepened very much. And those things are obviously are very applicable because the Divine Liturgy, we do it that's what we do. Every, you know, every Sunday we come together for the liturgy. So I'm very excited not only to teach and discuss with you guys, but also to learn myself. And uh, I hope that our gatherings this year, our monthly gatherings, will be very fruitful. This year, we finished the liturgy last year, and I was kind of wondering, well, what are we going to do now? What's going to be our next, what's going to be our next topic? What would be good and fruitful for us to kind of look at and dissect a little bit closer and maybe we're used to dissecting and looking at. And it came uh, to me, it, it, I thought it was good, a good idea to dovetail from the liturgy into the feasts of the Lord, because the two really go hand in hand. The liturgy is how we celebrate, first of all, the feasts, and the feasts of the Lord set up the liturgical calendar throughout the year. And so really to understand the feasts, is to understand the church calendar year and how it's set up. And, and that goes hand in hand again with our worship and with the liturgy in particular. I chose this quote, Lord, it is good for us to be here, which is from Matthew chapter 17, verse 4. This is from the uh, Feast of the Transfiguration. And Peter and James and John are on the mountaintop with Christ, and they see him transformed, and he is shining brighter than the sun. And Peter is overwhelmed and he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. And I chose this particular quote because, first of all, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us all to be together, to be talking about Christ and to gather in his presence and, and his, with his blessings. But also it's good uh, for us to be here applies because in the liturgy, which we've talked about now for a year and a half, in the liturgy we are present at these feasts. We talked about this last year, about how in the liturgy, not only do we remember, you know, our church, our church and our Bible are not a, a history museum exhibit where we just go and look and see what happened many years ago. We are in the liturgy for these feast days, we are brought to the events themselves again. We witness them with our own eyes and we hear the events with our own ears as if Christ was right in front of us as, uh, again. And so, Lord, it is good for us to be here, to witness to your truth, to witness to your, your, your glory and your blessings for us. So here's today's agenda. We're going to talk quickly about why, why study the great feasts, besides the fact that it kind of you know, intersects with the liturgy which we talked about last year. So we'll look at that question first. We'll talk about the great feasts as the story of salvation for humankind and for ourselves. We'll go to the beginning. I was thinking this morning on my drive into church, beginning is not the right word. It's really the, the preface, the preface of the story of salvation. So we'll talk about the preface of this story, and then we'll talk about the Annunciation, uh, and how the Annunciation is the kingdom recreated. 
and we'll talk last but not least about the Annunciation in our personal lives and what it means for us as Christians living in the 21st century. Sound good? We're all on board? All right, let's go. Okay, first question, why? Why study the great feasts? What's the point? Like I said in the, in the beginning, it's not a, a matter of learning what happened, where it happened, what the disciples were wearing, what kind of shoes they had on, what they ate the day before. It's not about that. What the great feasts and discussing and learning about the great feasts, why it's important in my mind is for two reasons. First of all, to show us how much God loves us, to show us how deep and endless His love for humankind is, and two, to show us and for us to understand and, and have our understanding and faith deepened that uh, He has given us everything, that God has given us absolutely everything. There was a re I was recently reading a book of a translation of, some, of the life and teachings of St. Porfirios. Raise your hand if you're familiar with St. Porfirios. He's a new saint. He lived in Greece in the 20th century. He died in the 90s. And he was a holy man who was a monk and then went into Athens and served in Athens in the Polyclinic, which is a hospital there for many years. And he was a very holy person. And now uh, our patriarchate canonized him as saint several years ago. And he says, for us, God is everything. In other words, God is the center of everything that we do. And if we separate ourselves from Him, we have nothing. So for us, God is everything. But for God, we are everything. This is St. Porfirios. For us, God, for us, God is everything. For God, we are everything. And so He does whatever it takes uh, to save us and to, uh, as I preached about today, to kind of lift us up back to, our, uh, to the state that we were in in paradise. So why do we study the feasts? To show us God's love and to show us that God has given us everything and how much we mean exactly to God. The great feasts make up for us the story of salvation. And I have here an icon, I also refer to this in my sermon today, of Christ lifting up Adam and Eve out of the tombs on the resurrection. So we have the resurrected Christ holding the cross, not as his instrument of death, but as the trophy of victory. And he's lifting up Adam and Eve out of Hades to return them to their original glory. So the great feast, as we go along, you'll see this year, my main point is going to be that these feasts that we are looking at, they show us how we are saved. And they show us how God has uh, saved us through his, through his love and His mercy for us. And this salvation is universal and personal. What do I mean by that? It's universal in a sense that God has done these things for all of humankind. What God did, He did for all humanity to be saved. But at the same time, He did it also for each and every one of us individually. Knowing each and every one of us intimately, as He does as our Creator and Maker, He did all of these things not only for humankind in general, but for Brother Dimitri, for all of you individually. It's almost like we can think about our own lives as the next chapter of the Scriptures. Uh, you know, the Bible ends with, uh, or the Gospels end with Christ being lifted up into heaven, telling the disciples, I will be with you always. And then we hear in Acts of the Apostles about how they went out and preached to the whole world and converted and, and formed the church. Well, now we are the church. We are that next chapter. The history has continued to this very day. And so we have that connection to the scriptures, to the feasts, to the story of salvation in our own personal lives and we write our own story of salvation every single day that we live. Especially when we live for God. Okay, the story begins. And again, like I said this morning, as we say in Greek, I, I repented of my wording here. The story begins, should be, I should have saved it for later. This is more the preface. We're going to talk about this next portion as the preface of the story. Okay, and we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 2, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God saw, that all, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. 
And so here we have the story of creation. The creation of humankind, of all the world, and God saw in the end that it was very good. And this is paradise. Now we're talking about Eden, we're talking about the Garden of Eden. So not only did God make Adam and Eve as part of creation, He made them special. He made mankind in His own image and likeness to be a mirror for Him, to reflect His light into the world, and to bring all of creation back to Himself. And He saw that everything He had made was very, very good. So Adam and Eve had a good in paradise. There was no sickness, there was no pain, there was no death. All the stuff that we deal with, the chaos, running around, all that stuff was, was not there. They lived in peace and they lived in union with God. And, they, and every day they walked with Him and spoke with Him. They had immediate access, face-to-face contact with God, their Creator. So this is the state that man is placed in in the very beginning. He's placed in paradise. And here's a, a beautiful icon I found of the creation of Adam and Eve. You can see almost how Christ and Adam, they have almost similar facial features. And that is because in the scripture, it's, a, it's a, from the scriptures, the made in God's image and likeness. Now, this is a physical representation of that. You know, showing Adam to look like Christ is a physical representation of being made in his image and likeness. But the deeper meaning of that is that humankind was meant to be a, a reflection of God in the world, in the created world. Not only that, but God also gives Adam a very special job. And he, Adam and Eve, so he makes humanity the head of creation. And he places them in the, in the front, so to speak. And he makes man almost a co-governor of Eden. So God is obviously the creator. He is the authority. But he gives Adam authority as well to have dominion over the earth and over the animals and the plants. And so Adam, in a sense, is... Uh, a co-keeper, a co-governor of, of paradise in, in Eden. And what was the purpose of that? The purpose of making humanity the chief of creation and the, was to be an intermediary between the created world and God. The world is supposed to be connected to God through us, through mankind. And so Adam and Eve, they entered into this ministry of taking care of the world and giving it back to God. Everything was supposed to be given back to God. So this is humanity's two jobs. To help God govern Eden and to protect the birthright of grace. What do I mean by that? Any ideas? The birthright of grace? Any thoughts? Again, like I said in the beginning, man didn't do anything to earn paradise. Adam and Eve were created and they were placed in the garden. This was a birthright. God gave them that, that privilege And he told them, you basically have one rule. You will not eat of the tree of good and evil. If you preserve your innocence and your purity by following my commandments, this gift that I have given you will be yours forever. And that is the gift of incorruption and immortality. The very next chapter of the Bible. So man and and woman are created. The very next chapter. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any true uh, tree in the garden? So this is, of course, the temptation of the snake to Eve. He's saying, Did God really tell you that? And he tells Eve further on, God told you that because he doesn't want you to be equal with him. Eat of the tree, and you'll see you'll become like him. You'll become like God. You'll be so powerful, just like him. And Adam and Eve, they fall into the trap, as we all know how the story goes. And here's another pair of mosaic icons here, very old from Italy, which depict Adam and Eve. You see the serpent on the left there. And uh, they have eaten of the tree. They're covering themselves, because remember, the Bible says that they were not clothed, but they were not embarrassed of their nakedness, because they were just... That was how creation was. They didn't have to be embarrassed. But when they ate of the fruit of the tree, they realized their nakedness and they covered themselves. So obviously this is taking place after Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree, which you see behind, in between Christ and Adam. And again, here you see Adam and Christ. They kind of have similar facial features here. And the next icon on the right, you see Adam and Eve are now clothed and they are being led out of paradise. That gate on the left with the red figure, that's the gate of Eden. 
And this is the angel with the fiery sword uh, that is guarding the gate to not allow humanity back in. So, in, one, in, in a matter of two chapters of the Bible, mankind is created and placed at the head of creation in paradise where everything is perfect and everything is grand. And literally by the next chapter, they, are, they fall and they are exiled. And the result of this is they lose their communion with God. They become susceptible to corruption and death, which become the new human reality. So they're out of paradise. Any questions so far? Nothing? We're good? Okay, we'll move forward. Now in the Old Testament, that's the very beginning of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is much larger than the New Testament. If you've ever, if you've ever taken a look and taken a minute to kind of contrast the sizes of the Old and New Testament, the Old Testament is very large. So from this very first pages of the Bible until the time of the New Testament, many things happen. We have many characters, many good characters. God and man are interacting. God is trying to raise Israel and to, uh, to bring them up you know, to where he wants them and where um, he can commune with them again. And they continue to turn their, back on, or turn their backs on God. And it's the cycle of repentance and sin. Israel's constantly sinning. God is... Uh, a bit withdrawing from them, and Israel's constantly repenting. But they never really can pull themselves out of the pit. They're constantly in this state of the fallen mankind, which we, which we talked about in this first portion. So we fast forward however many thousands of years to from the fall of mankind to the Annunciation, which we typically celebrate on March 25th which we always celebrate on March 25th. In the old calendar, uh, there was a possibility, the reason why I say typically, there was a possibility that March 25th or the Annunciation on the old calendar would, would have fallen on Pascha and on like Palm Sunday and other days, in which case it got very complicated. But the Annunciation now on the new calendar is always March 25th, no matter what. So I like to think of the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary uh, as God's, God's reaction to man's fall. It's almost like he had got to reach the point where he knew he had to intervene more directly. And so we have March 25th, the Annunciation. So this is our first feast that we're going to cover, the Annunciation, which is when, of course, Gabriel comes down and speaks to the Virgin Mary and brings the tidings of good news of God's coming into the world. So the Annunciation, we can think of it as the opening act of the drama. So if, if Adam and Eve are the preface, this is act one. Uh, there's a great quote uh, found here from St. Nikolai Velimirovic, who will quote uh, often. He is a Serbian saint who wrote many beautiful homilies. Uh, he says, The new creation is joy to God and man. It therefore begins with good news, and the Annunciation rejoice. With this word, the drama of the new creation is begun. It is the first opening word, heard while the curtain of the great drama is still rising. So as now the story is unfolding, the first word of the story is rejoice. So we see now in the Annunciation, the good news, the joy of God and man is coming again. The Annunciation is important, hugely important, because in the Annunciation, the kingdom, which in the beginning was Eden, man and, man and woman in Eden with creation, the kingdom is now being rebuilt is being recreated through the coming of Christ. There's a hymn in Vespers for this feast day that says, things below, meaning earth, are joined to things above, meaning heaven. And of course, they're joined together in the person of Jesus Christ, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Adam is renewed, and Eve is set free from her ancient sorrow. And if we look, and I'll refer to this more as we go along, if you look at the hymns from this feast day, it's constantly referring back to Adam and Eve and about how the things that took place then are being renewed and kind of redone. God is almost like uh, starting over again. This is another hymn from Orthros on the feast day of the Annunciation. It's a little bit long, but I thought it was perfectly applicable to what we're talking about. So this hymn, it's the last hymn of Orthros. It says, today, today, right now, today, is revealed the mystery that is from all eternity. So the mystery of all humankind is now being revealed today. 
The Son of God becomes the Son of Man, that sharing in what is worse, He may make me share in what is better. In other words, God becomes a man so that, not for His sake, but for mine, so that me, being connected with the divine, can become something more than what I am. In times of old, Adam was once deceived. He sought to become God. Remember, we were talking about the snake and how he was tempting Adam and Eve, and the temptation was to be like God. So Adam, he sought to become God, but he did not receive his desire. Now God becomes man, that he may make Adam God. Let creation rejoice, let nature exult. For the archangel stands in fear before the virgin, and saying to her, Rejoice, he brings the joyful greeting, whereby our sorrow is assuaged. You who in your merciful compassion was made man, our God, glory be to you. So that kind of paints the picture for us, what's going on here in the Annunciation. Cre creation, fallen creation is being renewed, is being made again through Christ. The first way we can think about this is as thinking of Christ as the new Adam. If Adam was the first created man, and he was made with a purpose in paradise to be a co-governor with God and to protect his, his birthright of, of grace, now Christ is being created, not in the sense of he was, that's his starting point because Christ is God. So his starting point is from eternity. He doesn't have a starting point. He's before eternity. But in the sense that he's now becoming a man, the way that Adam became a man, uh, Christ is now taking Adam's place. So here in the Gospel of Luke, this is the Gospel reading from the, from the liturgy that day. The Archangel Gabriel speaks to Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And he says a few lines down, Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So the Archangel Gabriel makes it very clear to the Virgin Mary who exactly this child is that she's going to give birth to. It's not just a, a person. It's not a, uh, it's not a simple man as have been born from women from the beginning of human, human history. But this is someone different. This is, he's going to be fully human because he will be born from you. But he is also the Son of God. He is the Son of the Highest. Now, this was a big point of contention in the early church. Who is Jesus Christ? Even from the perspective of who is Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary? So there was a man, uh, there was a bishop actually, Archbishop of Constantinople, whose name was Nestorius. I believe he was the Archbishop of Constantinople. I'll have to double check that, I'm pretty sure. I have to brush up on my church history from seminary. Uh, he taught that in the womb, Jesus was not God, but that the divine was paired up with him later at some point. That it was impossible for Mary to conceive God in her womb. But in the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Fourth Ecumenical Council takes place in 451 in Chalcedon. So imagine, from the time of Christ's birth, 0 A.D., till 451, 450 years, it takes the church to finally solidify its theology on who Christ is. So, in this decree of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, I'll paraphrase here because it's a large quote, We the Holy Fathers teach, and conf uh, teach people to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same, perfect in Godhead and perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead, meaning His divinity, He's one essence with the Father in divinity, and consubstantial with us according to manhood. So He's equal to God in His divinity, equal with us in our humanity. In all things like unto us, but without sin, begotten of the Father uh, according to the Godhead, and... In these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to manhood. So the Virgin Mary gives birth to God in his manhood. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, God and man, without confusion, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. So this is the Fourth Ecumenical Council, stating very firmly 
that the baby that is in the Virgin Mary's womb is both God and man. And this is extremely significant. St. Athanasius, who wrote a book called On the Incarnation, his theology was the driving theology of the First Ecumenical Council, which, did, which put down Arius and his uh, heresy of uh, Christ's, uh, Christ not being divine. So St. Athanasius says, what, or rather who, was it that was needed for such grace and such recall as we required? So he's talking now about the fall. He's saying, who can bring us out of that situation? Who could bring us out of the spiral of sickness and sin and death that humanity had been in since the, since the fall? Who could do that? He says, who, save the word of God himself, who also in the beginning had made all things out of nothing? So he's saying the only person that could do this is God himself who made us in the beginning. For he alone, being word of the Father and above all, was in consequence both able to recreate all and worthy to suffer on behalf of all and to be ambassador for all with the Father. In other words, only the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, which is the word of God, only the word of God by becoming a man has the authority and the power to recreate the kingdom that had fallen through Adam and Eve. Only he could bring us out of the situation that we had fallen into. So we know that kind of what the what is. What is taking place, who it is that's in, you know, in the womb of the virgin. But why is this coming of Christ as a man so significant? Especially, why is Jesus Christ being God and man so important? And why is him being born as a, as a, as a baby uh, being conceived as a baby so important and significant to us, humanity. Well, Christ is coming to undo Adam's error. So as we said earlier, Adam was charged with governing the garden and offering all creation back to God by being a reflection of God into the world and to bring all of creation and lifting it up to God. The way the priest lifts up the gifts in the divine liturgy, that's what Adam was supposed to do with creation. Offer it back to God to be transformed and transfigured and made perfect through him. Adam, though, failed. He failed miserably in his mission. Remember? Chapter 2, Adam's made. Chapter 3, Adam falls. One chapter later. Now, Christ has come to do the job that Adam could not. To bring all of creation and mankind together and to offer it to God. And so this is the task, when I say the story of salvation, of the great feasts, this is the story that is taking place, of Christ now undertaking this job, so to speak, that Adam has failed, and, by, and to offer everything back to God as it should have been. This is a quote from Metropolitan Ierotheos of Nafpaktos, who's wrote in many books, he's a modern day theologian, and a very holy person, and he writes, Therefore, Christ's assuming this mortal and passable body without sin by his incarnation, meaning Christ, by becoming a man in the incarnation, helped to correct the consequences of Adam's sin. Remember, we talked about the consequences of Adam's sin. What were they? Distance from God, corruptibility, sin, and death. So now, Christ, by becoming a man, is correcting these things in humanity. Through Christ's incarnation and resurrection, Human nature has been deified, and thus the possibility of being deified has been granted to every man, a woman. Man meaning human, every person. So by Christ's incarnation, and eventually, as the story goes on and the rest of the story, we see that humanity has been deified. Humanity has been made holy, has been made even godlike. Not in the sense that we become gods ourselves, but that we become so connected, we have the ability to become so connected with God that we have communion with Him. We experience His energies firsthand. Any questions? Are we all on the same page here? So incarnation, extremely important. Okay, Christ comes to undo Adam's error. In the, at the end, if we kind of summarized everything, now through Christ's incarnation, we have an opportunity. God doesn't force us to do anything. Even in the Incarnation, if, you read the, if we read the Scriptures uh, or hear the Gospel on that day, God comes down, or Gabriel comes down to Mary, and what does he say? God is going to do this? Or does he pose it as a question? He leaves it for Mary to decide to do it or to not do it. 
So even in God's incarnation, His coming as a man, He gives us freedom to choose yes or no. And thankfully, the Virgin Mary, of course, chooses yes. So we have an opportunity. God will not force salvation on us. Yes, George. Yeah, but you know, in the beginning, Eve was born without sin. Yes. And so her original sin was hers and hers alone. Although Virgin Mary, at the time of her birth, she, she was sinless at the time she conceived, but she was still born with the original sin, was she not? Original, original sin, sin meaning, what do you mean? She had the procreation from the first sin that was going forward. The reason we have communion today. We when, have, we baptize, when we baptize a child mm -hmm. who's innocent. So when, when Virgin Mary was born, mm -hmm. she had that same sin. Right. So she gave birth to Christ. But Christ was not born. A, born Christ, okay, so here's two parts, I need, two parts I want to clarify. Christ was conceived not in the natural order. Christ was conceived through the divine will and through the Holy Spirit. So his conception, so, the, and so that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is clarify what we mean by original sin. Because there's a lot of misconceptions about the, word, the term original sin. In the Catholic Church, original sin, I don't know if they still believe this because their theology has changed a little bit from Vatican II. Um, original sin for the Catholics means, as far as I know, I'm not Catholic, but as far as I know, uh, that the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin is on us when we're born. The guilt of it is on us. We believe something different. We don't believe that the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin is on us. I did not eat the fruit in the garden. Therefore, I am not guilty of the sin. However, because humanity fell through that sin, I have to live with the repercussions of it. I have to live with the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. Meaning that when I get old, I'm going to get sick and I'm going to die at some point. I have no way to escape from that because I'm, I'm living in the consequence of this sin. So when Christ is born, not through the natural way, or when Christ is conceived, not through the natural way of conception, but through the Holy Spirit, He enters into the fallen humankind, but He, in a sense, I don't want to get too technical, but He doesn't owe death anything. He doesn't have the sin, the, the guilt of sin, and he also is the divine as well. So he has the ability in his divinity to overcome the fallen human nature. That's why this feast is so important. Because we on our own can't overcome the fall. The, there's a term that we, you hear in sports a lot of time, but I think it applies to life as well. Father time is undefeated. In other words, nobody has lived forever. Nobody. No normal man has lived forever. Eventually, Father time catches up to you and you die. That's the way it goes. So we on our own could not get out of that. However, Christ, by being uniting, uniting his divine, immortal nature to our fallen human nature, lifted us up. Or he gives us the option, at least. He lifted us up in a general sense, giving an opening, you know, we'll talk about it as we go on month, in these future months, about how he lifts up humanity and perfects it again and gives us the chance to be in heaven with him in paradise. Um, so I don't know, I hope that kind of answers your question. So yes, the Virgin Mary does ha have original, the original sin in the sense that she also lives in the fallen state of humankind. She's not guilty of Adam and Eve's sin. We have to be to clarify of that. So when Christ is conceived, he also enters into that fallen humanity, but with the divine as well. So he's able to overcome it. That's, that's kind of the point I wanted to make. I hope that makes sense. If you have more questions, we can discuss later on as well. So uh, we have the opportunity now through Christ to overcome the results of the fall through our new relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Remember, in paradise, through the fall, God, man and God were separated. A man is cast out of paradise. Now, God and man are brought together in the person of Jesus Christ. So we have a new, there's a new relationship being formed. St. Gregory Palamas... I'll paraphrase it here because we're running out of time. But St. Gregory Palamas, he gives a good analogy. He says, imagine a boulder on the top of a mountain. If the, mount, if the boulder falls down, it's going to hit the mountain and it's going to leave crags. It's going to leave holes. It's going to destroy the mountainside as it goes along until it goes all the way to the very bottom. So it leaves almost like a path of destruction in its, uh, in its wake until it gets to the, the very bottom. So he says in the same way, when we fell from paradise... Uh, and the godly way of life, we were brought down to Hades, like the boulder, falling from the top to the bottom. That's how man fell, from the top of the mountain to the bottom. And he says, almost all our life became pain and sorrow, like the mountainside, torn up by the boulder falling. 
All our life became pain and sorrow. However, God, who made us, looked lovingly down on us in his mercy. He bowed the heavens and came down. Having taken our nature upon him from the Holy Virgin, he renewed and restored it. Or rather, he led it up to divine and heavenly heights. So Christ, who is on the top of the mountain as God, comes down to the bottom of the mountain in order to lead us back up the broken road that we have made, that made for ourselves. Does that make sense? I thought that analogy was very beautiful. St. Gregory Palamas. And this is St. Athanasius again. He says, you know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel, so now imagine like a board or a canvas that has a portrait on it, when it becomes obliterated through external stains. So imagine you have a, a portrait and for some reason somehow it gets destroyed. The artist does not throw away the panel, which you can see if you ever see some of Picasso's works. He actually reused some of his canvases because he was, he was poor and he couldn't afford to throw them away. And that was Picasso. So the artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for the portrait again. He brings, so in other words, he doesn't throw it away. He brings the person back and makes them sit down so he can repaint it. And then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. So now, imagine, so now use this as our analogy. Even so, it was with the Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself and seek out his lost sheep. So in the beginning, God made Adam to be like him, right? He made, an, he made a portrait almost of himself, but it was Adam. So instead of a painting, he made man to be an image of himself. But that image became destroyed through Adam and Eve's sin. So what does he do? He sits for the portrait again. He recreates the portrait, not through Adam, but through himself, by coming down and becoming a man and, and living among us so that he can make us new again and seek out the sheep that are lost. It's 12 o'clock, so I'm going to pause here. We can, we're going to continue uh, next month with the Annunciation and we'll hopefully be able to move forward. Are there any questions before we depart for this week? Yes, Alex. Was the, was the Virgin Mary even a human? Um, so the question was, was the Virgin, is the Virgin Mary considered sinless? Uh, sin, so sinless, again, is a complicated term. Uh, she, again, carries with her the original, original sin in the sense that she lives in the broken humankind that we do. We have no way of knowing how, what she, you know, how her life was. What we do know is that from the time she was three years old, she lived in the temple. And she was living constantly in glorification of God. She was reading the scriptures. She was uh, worshiping in the services. She was living a very angelic life. And the tradition of our church states that she was even, angels were bringing her bread from heaven to feed her. So she was even eating heavenly food, according to our tradition. And so from the time of three years old until the time this happens, she's, she's a young maiden at this time, 15, 16 years old probably. She's living in the temple in the most pure and holy life probably possible for a human being. Does that mean she didn't sin? Well, we'd have to open up a lot of theological books to really un kind of get to the root of that. But we do know that she is, we consider her, the reason why God chose her was because she was the perfect vessel for him to come into the world. She was chosen for a reason. It wasn't because she was a random, it wasn't at random. It was because she was living the pure and holy life in the temple to the best of her abilities. And, uh, and so that's why God chose her and gave her the choice. Remember, again, it's a choice. She chose to have God come and dwell in her womb. And really, we, I think, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but I think we would say she, her life was perfected through her becoming the mother of God. So it's not that her life was, I would, say, I would have to say, you know, I'm not going to say that. I don't want to be a heretic, so I'm, I can't say that. But I would say her life is perfected through her relationship with Christ, through being directly in contact. Imagine carrying God in your womb for nine months, intimately knowing him the way a mother knows a child, and that child being not only a child but God as well. So she knew God on an intimate, intimate, intimate level. And so through that, she, her life is perfected. That's what I would say to answer that question. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Any more any more questions before we leave? Okay, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll meet again uh, next month. We'll continue with the Annunciation and hopefully move forward with the Feast of the Lord. May God bless all of you.
Ai, 